Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up, if you don't subscribe to our Women's Performance Newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. Hello, feisties. For today's episode, I am talking to Diane Mais, who is the first Black American to win an NCAA championship in diving. And that was in the 90s, and she is still the only woman to have won an NCAA championship in diving since then. Diane talks about her upbringing as a person of color adopted into an Italian family living in a Jewish neighborhood, how she was talent ID'd at a local pool and recruited into diving, only to later be told she would never go anywhere because of the color of her skin. Diane and I also discuss the issues of body image and eating disorders in the sport of diving. I was particularly impressed by the way that that Diane has taken some challenging experiences, to say the least, and channeled them into helping diversify diving and helping young divers. Also, if you haven't heard already, Feisty Media's first course, first online course, Fueled, is running for the first time in April. So if you'd like to be part of that founding cohort, and you are an active woman who is looking to fuel your life properly and work with your female-specific physiology, then this is the course for you. Just head to fueledcourse.com to join the waitlist, and we will send you all the details. That's fueledcourse.com. Com. I will also stick that link in the show notes. Hi, Diane. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I have. I was listening to while I was like chopping vegetables, making dinner last night, I was listening to a podcast with you on it. Um, and it was super interesting. But you, ha- you had this story about how you were kind of discovered as a diver with like, including like a man in a van. <laughs> like, was, like, tell us about there, that. There you are, 1980s. Um, so that helps to date, you know, how old I am. But yeah, no, I was um, a a gymnast and at my summer club, you know, they had diving boards. So I would do gymnastics off of the diving boards, uh, mm-hmm. you know, jumping, flipping, uh, some flips with some twists. And there was a, an older gentleman. I mean, I think when you're 11 or 10 years old, everyone's old. Right. But, mm-hmm. um, there, there was this older gentleman who was going around to all the local, uh, clubs and, trying to recruit kids for diving but you know we did not know that he but because he was standing outside the fence like watching uh, (laughs) and a little creepy yeah totally I mean completely and and nowadays I mean you know if he had even parked his van for a half a second the police would be called but um back then no one no one even you know wasn't a concern he just stood there and was watching and then eventually he walked um to the front gate Mm -hmm. and was able to come in uh, and he walked over to me and, you know, of course, again, approaching a child, <laughs> it's definitely not something we do today, but he approached me and he asked, where's your mother? And I instantly thought I was in trouble. Um, <laughs> you know, that just seemed to be the, the common, the common thread being, um, one of only four kids at the, at the club that were not white. Um, so anytime someone approached us, we always thought, we did something wrong, right. but he actually was asking me, um, you know, where my mother was to go ask her about me joining a, or trying out for a dive program that they were starting at the local college, um, 
which was an hour away, but that was considered local. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, long story short, um, you know, my, my, my version of it was, you know, my mom said yes. And I was in his van driving up to practices with, with, with <laughs> a bunch of other got, kids. Got in a van with a strange man. Yeah. But the reality is it took us a few weeks for all that to be organized. But so, yes, we were up, uh, we were driving up with the coaches um, in their, in their minivans or whatever vehicle they had. Um, and there was a group of like 12 of us from our area that started uh with the with a dive program about an hour away from our from our homes so yeah mm. and kind <laughs> of I mean besides happen <laughs> yeah like besides the funny man in van funny <laughs> funniness about it I I also think it's like it's a bit of a childhood dream to be like talent I need for something you know like I can remember as a kid feeling like well someone's gonna see me playing soccer and figure out that like I am the next best thing <laughs> right and, and that actually happened to you so I think that's that's uh kind of cool um do you think that that moment um helped your like helped your confidence as you went through like the, the next years? hundred percent because the year prior I had actually um, asked to join a team that majority of the kids on my dive team at, um, at the, at the summer club participated with my mom took me out there and um, the coach pretty much appeased me for, you know, the hour and a half practice. And afterwards told me I need to find another sport. Um, oh yes. And, but later to find out that he said that to anyone of color. Um, and the reason he even accepted or allowed me to come for a practice was he thought I was like all my other teammates coming from, you know, a country club and in the suburbs of Philadelphia outside, uh, you know, in New Jersey, he just assumed that I was just like the rest of the kids that came from that club. So of course he said, yes, you can come try out for the team. And like I said, he tolerated me for about an hour and a half. And when we were done, he said, I don't think diving's for you. So sorry, wait, he said that, but before he saw you, is that? He said, no, he said I could come thinking I was like my, my other teammates right. from my club. Um, and, you know, obviously coming from, not obviously, but coming from that country club, coming from that neighborhood, um, it was something my parents could afford. Yeah. So just the, you know, the assumptions. And then when I got there, I did not look like everyone else. Um, and he just, I guess in as polite way as you can say, he said, I don't think diving's for you. You should find another sport. And I found out later from another coach from uh, a club that wasn't too far from there, that that was the common thread. And he received, this other coach received multiple athletes that were told that from from this coach. I'm sorry. Um, that's so awful. Um, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Is that, um, at that point though, like, how do you interpret that phrase? Like he's, you know, he knows, for example, it's, he's not saying, I don't think you can afford it. Right. Right. He's lit. It's literally just pure racism. Is that, mm -hmm. yes. Oh God. Yeah. Um, I'm and when there's very few clubs around, um, and you know, my parents couldn't, I mean, I was one of four children, so they were not, you know, going to be stopping me around. And most of the practices, most of the teams were at least 45 minutes to an hour away. Mm -hmm. And unless there were other kids that were involved in our area that we could carpool with, there was no way I was going to be a part of any program. Right. And that's why like the man in the van was kind of like, you know, creepy, but at the same time, a savior. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, and he came a year later. Um, but I, I honestly, also being only around 11 or 12 years old, I didn't see it that way as racism. And I don't know. I really don't know how my mother saw it. Mm -hmm. I think she, she's so, well, my parents are wonderful, um, <laughs> but they, they were not athletic. Um, they adopted two, two children, my older brother and I from two different families. And we both came with a lot of athletic, natural athletic ability. Mm -hmm. um, so they helped us hone in on that, like helped us do whatever sport we wanted. But in the same time, they didn't understand mm. what it was like to be an athlete or what, like, what, so when the guy said, I'm not good enough, my mom's like, Oh, you're not good enough to be a diver. Like she didn't, like, she didn't know any different to be like, well, you are pretty good. You know, you, you compete with the same kids that are, that he's coaching. Um, it wasn't, wasn't part of her thought process. So, um, so yeah, when the opportunity came up a year later, it was definitely um, very motivational mm -hmm. uh, and, and exciting because 
I went from someone rejecting me to someone wanting me. Right. And that's, that's huge as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I also related to that part of your story. I was also adopted in the seventies. Um, oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, if I could ask a little about your story, but I know my, my, my younger sister, she was adopted in 1978 and has this hilarious story where you just have like a doctor, like handing over a baby on a golf course, you know, like it's just like, it's kind of like the wild west of adoption back then. Um, I would have to agree. <laughs> yeah. So um, what was your experience like kind of growing up um, with like, like as a person of color in, it was your family white? Is that right? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. my parents are white and they ended up, um, you know, the typical story couldn't have children. So they adopt to, my dad wanted a basketball team. He wanted at least five children. Um, and so they started with adopting two. and a few months after they adopted me, mom was pregnant. Wow. Um, and then a few years after, uh, my sister came along, she was pregnant again with my younger brother. So, um, our, my family consists of, you know, I have three siblings, um, my older brother who's also adopted, but, um, and he is, um, my understanding is he's a, a mix of Armenian black and, um, and I think white, mm-hmm. but, and then I'm, my, my, my father is black. My mother is white mm-hmm. and then my siblings, both are a product of my parents. So mm-hmm. they are both white. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was just funny though, because every once in a while, the fact that my parents had two black children um, came out, like there was a newspaper uh, written article written about our family. Um, and it it's fine. I mean, I, I would have to find it to read it now, but I'm sure it was like, <clears throat> seemed very enlightening then, but now it's probably really bizarre, <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was not so much that especially the neighborhood we grew up in, it wasn't so much that we were two black kids living in a white family or in a white neighborhood, but um, it was pretty much that we were a Catholic family living in a 98% Jewish neighborhood. Mm, right. Um, <laughs> like there's, there were so many other things that were, and my parents had four kids when everyone else had two. Like, right. There were so many other things that made our family stand out that I don't think that my brother and my race was at the forefront. Um, really the only time that became an issue was my senior year of high school. Um, And my sister was a junior. She's just one year behind me. It was the end of the school year and um, it was lunchtime. There was a couple different lunch periods. Mine was before my sister's. I left the house without grabbing my lunch money or anything to eat. So I went to my sister's, the classroom she was in um, and walked up to the teacher Mm -hmm. and said, I'm so sorry um, to interrupt, but can I ask my sister if she has any lunch money or she like grabbed mine because I forgot mine. The teacher looked around the classroom and just said, who in here could possibly be your sister? <laughs> um, and then the wonderful thing is the class was filled with all juniors and seniors who know my sister and I very well. And needless to say, it caused a small uproar. Um, I instantly burst into tears because I had never really felt like other having we've always had kids ask us, especially like in the summertime right. at the beach. Um, I got really tan, my sister, not so much. Um, and so we would always come out of like the ocean or whatever, playing somewhere and run up to our mom, mom, tell them we're sisters, tell them we're sisters. And she'd be like, okay, yes, they are sisters. She's like, now girls tell them why you're a sisters or how you're a sisters. I'm like, well, I'm adopted. But anyway, we're sisters. Like, you know, it was, but to have an adult question it for the, that was the first time we've had it presented to us. Now I'm sure my parents were questioned all the time. Um, you know, especially when I'm with my mom and my sister and I would turn around and say, Hey mom, and that would probably turn heads. Um, but it it was just really hard when an adult questioned us. Mm-hmm. We would like to think that the world is a little more open-minded. Yeah. But, and that was in the early 90s. Yeah. So. I think, I don't know. I've got a couple different friends with like mixed race kids for various reasons, whether it's like through the partner or like they adopted kids. And some of the questions, like when you start to talk to them, some of the questions people ask them, I'm like, what <laughs> you know what I mean like well that comes with adoption too like people will say well you're real mom I'm like well people adopted me are my parents like those are you know well you mean like the well the person that like gave you up for adoption I'm like my biological like there are there are words for this but like the real real is not one of the words that we <laughs> yeah <can> <laughs> no that that's right it is and I get obviously I got some of those questions too right where people ask you about my 
my mom, like my mom is the person who raised me, right? Like yes. that's, yes. <laughs> of course. Um, okay. I feel like I could talk about that stuff all day, but <laughs> let's go yeah. back to you. So <laughs> a long story short, um, you end up becoming the first black female NCAA champion in diving. Am I right about this? Yes. And actually the first, uh, first black person. First black person. person. Yes. And just, um, as of last year, um, the first black man, um, has become an NCAA champion. Wow. So 25 years later. So, um, wow. Yeah. Progress is slow. And, and I, <laughs> I know that, um, and, and we'll talk about kind of like your work in that area a bit later, but like, you know, I, and I know that typically folks who are the first, like that, that's not necessarily how they experience that, you know, is that, did you know at the time, did you think I'm going to be the first person I'm breaking new ground here or, or what, what was your experience? Not at all. Um, honestly, I really, my race was, I can't, I can't say it was always tried to be like put on the back burner, but it was not talked about. It was just the fact that she's a diver. Mm-hmm. And, and granted, a lot of the kids that I dove against asked questions and, you know, they were always shocked. Oh, your hair gets wet. I'm like, yeah, I jumped in the pool. Like, why wouldn't it get wet? Like, <laughs> The, the things that like people like you know assume um because of my race but it it really wasn't well it wasn't a driving force for me it wasn't something I thought about oh well, I'm gonna be the first black person to do this I just thought that I just hadn't been anywhere where there were other black divers yet like there had to be there had to be others um and there were but still I never met them I met a couple coaches um who definitely I think when they were on the pool deck was a saving grace for me to know that, okay, I, cause I questioned often, did I belong here? Mm-hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of that happened in at college. I actually left my first university because I was pretty much told by other athletes from another sport that I did not belong. Mm. Um, so it wasn't, yeah, that wasn't the driving force for me. And I didn't know what happened. Honestly, I didn't know that I was the first NCAA champion until the world took a pause in 2020. Oh, um, that's when it was, uh, you know, told to me. And then, and they also um, let me know that I was the first female to coach a division one college in diving. Right. So I was like, oh, you know, things, I mean, I didn't knew, like I said, I don't know of any other uh, black female coach from the U S uh-huh. um, my friend, she did coach at GW. Uh-huh. Uh, she's from Bermuda. Um, first black woman to coach, to dive in the Olympics. Uh-huh. And that was only in 2004, but it definitely was not something I was aware of until literally just recently. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think I remember your friend <laughs> because, because it's, you know, I love the diving. Like that's one of my favorite. Do you hear this a lot? Like it's one of my favorite Olympic sports to watch. It is one of the um, top three of, of watched summer sports. And then I think it's in the top five for all Olympic sports. So yes, I do hear that a lot and it makes sense. Yeah. It's such a, I mean, it's such a great spectator sport. Um, and I do remember, like I had a moment where, um, I must be your friend. I noticed her standing out at the Olympics and I thought, oh shit, (laughs) like, is this really the state of this sport? Like, you know, and also like, what about me? Like, what about the fact that I hadn't noticed this until now? Like, how did it land on you when you learned, like you said, you only learned recently that you were the first black um, NCAA mm-hmm. champion and diving. Like, how did, how did that feel? Lonely. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't really an exciting thing to hear because, and and also to know that there hasn't been another since. Like that was really what actually turned around and started my drive for all that I'm doing now, because I don't want to be the only one and I shouldn't be the only one. Um, you know, it's, it's, great that I have being the first as a catalyst and as a, as a way to be able to, you know, be in places like this to talk about, um, what I'm, what I'm doing because of that. But that's really, it wasn't like, yay, let's celebrate. Hooray. But I also think because it wasn't, it wasn't acknowledged till over 20 to 25 years later. Mm. Like, that's the other thing. It's like, okay, well, so obviously, you know, and I'm finding with, with even some of my athletes of color who do things at their schools or whatever, there's not excitement in that. It's kind of like, oh, 
they broke the record and it didn't belong to a you know it belonged to a white person before at a pretty much all white school like Mm -hmm. there's funny things like when when a black person accomplishes something in especially in our sport in diving it's questioned Mm -hmm. and then because there isn't a history of consistency Mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. um so yeah so it it wasn't I mean like I said it's nice to know but it was definitely wasn't like a yay happy moment (laughs) right so you are working now to increase the diversity in diving tell us about dive into diversity yes well um dive into diversity is um, a showcase series that we are bringing to um different dive programs around the country um we're so excited our first stop is going to be in tempe arizona at the end of april Mm -hmm. and the event is set up with um, a vip reception the evening before followed by a diving showcase with some of our top athletes and coaches um, in our country and you know uh, couture is going to be joining us from bermuda uh, and We have um, a diver from Puerto Rico who's going to be joining us. We also have one of the um, high divers. So the new event for the sport of diving that a lot of people have seen it, like the Red Bull cliff diving. They Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, We have a gentleman who's joining us from there. And all the divers that are participating Mm -hmm. um, are either past Olympians or, um, you know, future, hopefully future Olympians. And they are people from historically marginalized groups in the sport of diving. So we have people who are from the Asian American community. We have people from the um, Latino and Mexican community. We have people from the black community. And um, it's because we can pretty much count on, you know, one hand for each of those groups, how many people have been involved at our national level for our sport. Mm -hmm. And there are so many more people out in our community that probably have the ability, um, have the talent, and they just don't have the access. And a lot of that is historically related. Um, You know, when pools and everything were um, privatized, a lot of the areas where people, people of wealth, that's where they built the pools. And therefore, it was a self-made segregation to not, you know, so people couldn't. And then, then when they made those other pools, it closed down the public pools because the tax dollars weren't there anymore mm. from the white community that lived there because they moved to the suburbs. And so a lot of cities don't have pools um, or have the right equipment or um, in, and where the main drive for dive and diversity is to refill those pools and give access again to those who didn't and to provide the financial support. Mm-hmm. Um, Part of what we're doing is in each city we go to, we're building a scholarship fund. So local communities can provide the um, the funds, the fees for these kids to be able to continue to dive. Because I'm not a big fan on, you know, those sports that come and teach kids how to do it for a day, but don't leave a program for them to continue with. Right. It's like, wow, you've just angled a carrot that is totally not possible for them. Because even if it was $25 a week or it's not, it's not possible Mm -hmm. because they don't have those funds available. And I found that out when it came to our, my own city of Richmond, where diving does not exist. There isn't a public pool with a diving board here, Um, but we are here to change that also. But when I um, found out from a friend that we have six public pools in our city and they were empty during like some of the prime times of the day, the hottest parts of the day. And she asked, uh, a police officer who she knew, like, why are the pools empty? And he's like, well, majority of people don't have proper attire. They don't have a bathing suit. So if you don't have a, the basic necessity, and that's a luxury. It's not, I mean, you know, but I feel like in the summertime, that's a necessity. It's not a luxury. Yeah. And the, you know, and I understand due to the um, chemicals that are in the pool, you can't wear like a cotton t-shirt or something that's not made for those chemicals because it'll get broken down and get in the filtration system. And that's thousands of dollars to have to repair. So I'm all for making sure people have the right equipment to be in the pool, but then let's provide that. So um, our nonprofit, um, Dive RVA, has collected over 2,000 bathing suits to give out to our community so they can have access. Yeah. And it's something we have ongoing because, you know, bathing suits hopefully will get you through a whole summer, but they might not. Um, and then you grow. And so you need new ones. So we can't just provide it once. So you have to, it's a continual support. And we have bathing suits for 
um, well, one, ad- kids come in all sizes. Mm-hmm. They're not all little, you know, 12 year old mini bodies. Mm-hmm. So we have men's and women's sizes for kids and for adults, because these kids can't get into the pool by themselves. They, you know, they need the adults to go with them. Um, so that is our first step of getting more people into the sport of diving is to get them into the pool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we have to give them bathing suits. Right. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really is like, a, you know, a grassroots program. Um, and we're hoping to bring that to multiple cities throughout, throughout our country. And we have a second after Tempe, we have a second one lined up um, in Riverside, California mm-hmm. in the middle of July. And we are working on a date, hopefully for um, a city in North Carolina with, you know, three, probably three or four more to come next year. So that's so cool. Okay. So just so I understand correctly, like a showcase series means that like, is it something that folks can buy tickets to? Yes. Well, we're um, the VIP event they can buy tickets to because that's where you would have the meet and greet and get autographs signed by by these Olympic athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next day with the showcase, these divers would um, show off their talents. We get all the oohs and ahs, you know, and we're inviting kids from the local schools and Boys and Girls Club and different groups, different communities mm-hmm. that support. Um, we have one group that is. Um, a safe haven for LGBTQ plus children. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them, it's even a foster program because a lot of them have been rejected by their families. Mm-hmm. These kids are invited. Um, we've, we've got anyone who doesn't have the resources, mm-hmm. they're invited. And, um, and from that, after they watch the showcase, those, those kids will get to meet the athletes. And then the coaches and athletes will be doing a dive clinic. And mm-hmm. what I've also found is not everyone is comfortable or safe in, in deep water. Right. So we're also having a water safety component with that. Mm-hmm. So after the dive show, kids will break up into groups that will be taking a water safety course. And those who are already proficient, they will be learning the skills, um, uh, basic skills of diving. So it's a clinic on top of the showcase. That's so great. Um, and then anyone who's interested gets to you know sign up and, and we will provide scholarship funds for them to continue with the local programs in the area to, to continue to learn how to dive. That is incredible. And so is this, are these things that folks can donate to or how does that work? hundred um, percent. They can definitely um, reach out to, well, one of the, one of the ways is like, honestly, directly through me. <laughs> um, and my information is Diane at um, dive into diversity, but um Another way is through Dive RVA. That is um, a nonprofit that is set up to help support and provide diving. Um, and then also through Compete Sports Diversity. Ah, um, an organization that I know well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and they are fabulous. Um, mm-hmm. They're one of our sponsors for this event. Okay. And they would be a great resource um, to, to reach out to, especially to help with the Tempe event. Um, and the Riverside event, they are, they are, uh, big supporters of both of those events, but, um, I can definitely provide more information yeah. for you if you have somewhere to post it or, but yes, there, it's, there are plenty, plenty of ways to help. And we are all obviously, um, always need funds to help these kids be able to, to, per, to participate in a new sport. Yeah, for sure. And we, and we'll put all those links in the show notes. For decades, running shoes have been researched tested and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedas. Hedas designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. Hedas unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male biased industry. Hedas have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. 
Hedes has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedas at Hedas.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedas.com and it will all be in the show notes. As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tafosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. Tafosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They are shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat, so they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tafosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20. FM as in feisty media to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Building muscle can be tough and gains can be so slow, even for those of us who do a lot of strength training. As an ex-endurance athlete who is now in perimenopause, I know this all too well. It can be frustrating to put in the time in the gym and not see the results I'm looking for. That's why it's super important to take the right supplements at the right time. One of those supplements is essential amino acids, which are needed to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis happens when you eat high quality protein, like eggs or whey. And by supplementing with additional essential amino acids, you can make sure you are getting the full benefit of your training sessions. Targeted essential amino acid formulas can be up to four times more effective than just eating protein. I've been taking amino acids for almost a year, and in combination with eating quality protein and a couple other supplements, I have managed to turn the tides on age-related muscle loss, which starts at 30 for women, by the way, and I have continued to make strength gains as I head towards 50. AminoCo has been a longtime sponsor of Feisty Media and has supported all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. I wanted to ask you too about um, something in particular. We have this conversation, we're having a lot of conversations right now about um, fueling for female athletes, um, in particular about how like diet culture and that culture of like restricting our eating to look a certain way or to in, in some sports um, tends to be worse than others. And we've found this is a big problem. And, you know, it's certainly an endurance sports where I come from, but the more we talk about it, the more we realize there's lots of Definitely. this. Yeah. It's everywhere. Um, and I'm wondering if there are challenges in, <laughs> I, I can see, sorry, I can see your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah. whether that challenge, like, is it persistent in, in diving and, and what do you see are, are things? Yeah. How, what's this current state with that kind of stuff? Um, it, it's, it's, it, it totally is there. Um, I mean, here's a sport where you're pretty much, you know, as I say, you're pretty much half naked for, you know, performing, um, athletically, so and you're being really, judged, right? Even though technically, yes, I'm assuming yes, you're supposed well, you to be judged, judged on what you're 
doing. But it, there's a it's overall impression. So overall, if you're not looking pretty darn awesome, it's going to make your dive not look pretty darn awesome. So um, yes, and actually, it's it's funny that you said it because it really like it, that moved my heart because um, that was an issue I had in college. Um, I was brought onto a team, and all the girls were these pretty ballerinas like they were um same height as me but they were they were tiny um and I like my coach before my my junior coach um when I was diving she would always get comments from other wow she can jump as high as the guys like she but I was built I mean I had strong legs I you know I I was a powerful jumper Mm -hmm. um and that translated well to diving I mean, I did the high jump and, and track. I was a gymnast who loved um, floor. Like my whole thing was, let me jump as high as I can so I can be floating in the air for as long as I can. Mm-hmm. And to be able to transition that to diving was awesome. But when I got to college, I realized, wow, I am built like one of the guys more so than the girls on this team. Mm-hmm. And it became um, a challenge for me to, like, I actually, I developed eating disorder. I one day passed out. Um, in the locker room and the trainer when it came to they they asked you know like what was like when was the last time no what was the last thing that you ate and I was so proud of myself I'm like a banana and then the other trainer said when and I was still very proud of myself and I said three days ago and I found nothing wrong with that um oh. and because I was still able to go through my day and go through my life and had no idea what I was doing to my body yeah. inside um and so I would like to think that that doesn't exist anymore in our sport, but it totally does. There, are, um, like you know, we see athletes at, only at meets, so that time frame in between, and you see another, you see an athlete, like, whoa, like you, then you go and ask the coach, like, are they okay? Like they, because also when you're with your coach every day, they might not see it, they might not see the drastic change, but um, you know, when others do, and then then again, how do you address the athlete? How do you get them help? How do you find out? you know, really what they're doing because you can't monitor them 24 mm-hmm. seven. And, and I, that whole idea that if you aren't like, I don't know, 8% body fat, 10% body fat, um, then in runners, it's even leaner. Um, you know, then, then you're not going to be any good. Like I, that's totally, you know, and then we have plenty of athletes that are out there. Um, and I, like you said, especially in diving, we are judged and, those girls who are, who are healthy in every which way, Mm -hmm. I would tell you probably don't get the same scores just because aesthetically that's not a diver, but they are, look at, they're doing the dives. They are flipping around two and a half, three and a half times. They are putting those dives in without a splash. That's a diver. Mm -hmm. But so we have to change our mindset too, of what a true athlete looks like. Yeah. Is that, what is the conversation happening in diving? Do you hear people talking about this? Um, Yes, but I'm not sure it's always the right people. And I'm not sure it's going as far as it should. Yeah. Um, when you have a sport that is male dominated by coaches mm. and female dominated by athletes, that's a hard conversation to have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's another push and initiative of the um, DEI Council for USA Diving mm-hmm. is to have more women in higher levels of coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think having more people present helps conversations happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't think we have enough people. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm going to guess it's similar to like the conversation in my sport it often, especially when I was an athlete was like, there was this blame the athletes kind of culture of like, Oh, it's like, you need to look a certain way and put all this pressure on the athlete. Right. And then, <laughs> you know, when they develop an eating disorder, it's like, well, it's your fault. <laughs> you have a problem, you know, and that's just complete BS. Right. Um, and then you have this interest different, like you mentioned earlier, like where you, you realize like you didn't look like these skinny white girls, you know, kind of thing, like who were diving with you. Right. Like you have this intersection with, with race as well, that where like the whole conversation needs to evolve and change. Um, so, sorry, that's more like, <laughs> that's more of a, co- a comment than a question, but I just feel like we have so far to go with that stuff. And I really want to see like athletes 
thriving and being able to fuel themselves properly, you know? And, and I don't know where, and one, I think also the idea that one size fits all. Mm. Um, I know when I was an, an athlete um, in college, we were an event in swimming. So we were trained in the weight room like swimmers, mm. but we need like, I don't need huge, broad shoulders. And like, it just, it was such a different, like, I need plyometrics. I need rebounding. I need things that are going to help me, you know, and I need flexibility on top of that. Um, and you know, granted in so many places, so many schools that has changed. I mean, I'm talking about an experience from 25 years ago, but, um, but the education for coaches, the education that one size doesn't fit all, it needs to, needs to be heard or needs to be developed um, because, you know, I I was handed a a diet plan and that's great. If I'm a swimmer, (laughs) if I'm burning that many calories, but I'm not, I'm not an endurance sport. Um, And, and also my body type is different. So like, there's just so many things that need to be addressed and it's, and it is a one size fits all package. Yeah. How did you recover from the eating disorder? Um, can't say I truly ever did. Um, it, it had totally destroyed my metabolism. Um, and you know, once, once I stopped diving at the age of 28, um, and had my son, um, it has been a struggle since, um, but and cause it just, cause my athletic life was gone and I was truly never taught how to properly eat. And, and uh, in, for the last 20 some years, I, that has been a sh- constant struggle for me. So, yeah, I don't think it's, it hasn't left me. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your openness on that. I think that's very relatable, um, with, with a lot of people and all, often that way, if it's hard to shift that focus off of food, once you've lived with it for so long, you know? Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm like, <laughs> like now I'm all emotional. Um, <laughs> well, it's the relatability, right? I mean, like it's not just happened. doesn't happen to just one or two. It's, I think the majority of athletes have different relationships with food. <laughs> mm-hmm. Does it change the way that you coach? Completely. I never address body. I never address, um, you know, uh, what like you know but I do ask my athletes especially when they're coming in they're like tired and I have a lot of high school athletes and you know, female athletes um and you know, my question to them is did you eat today and then what did you eat and the majority of them hadn't eaten since the morning and they might have had a bagel or a piece of toast and it's like okay we are now at five o'clock in the evening and you're asking your body to exert so much more energy and you have no, nothing left in you, no, no fuel. We um, do like to try to keep, you know, an arsenal of, of protein bars or something um, for the kids, but they're like, I would, I would believe that we have some young ladies who are, who are dealing with the same thing I did. Who like, they like, no, no, I'm fine. I don't need to eat anything. Um, But then I turn around and I make them sit out and like, there are different consequences for they're not addressing their eating. Um, and so if they don't want to sit out, then, then they'll eat, <laughs> um, because it, it is dangerous. It is, it is scary. Um, and, and I haven't, you know, I, there's not, like I said before, one size that fits all, I haven't figured out how to be able to address them all. If there, there have been a couple athletes that I have been very concerned with, uh, cause other coaches in our program have said, you know, so-and-so, you know, are they okay? They're, they're looking really thin. Mm-hmm. and we will call the parents because they are still minors and then get them involved and say, just, just let you know, this is what our staff has noticed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something that I, I try to address from the eating side of it, but definitely not from the physical. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense. Um, well, Diane, I thank you so much for like all the work that you do, like the, the intersection where you sit is so incredible almost. And the fact that you're making change across the board in so many different places. Um, Trying to. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, yeah. Thank you for the work that you do and for coming on the podcast today. This has been great. Thank you.
Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. Prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose. As we head into summer, rest and recovery are critical for improving sports performance, reducing stress, and living a long and healthy life. We should all invest in better sleep. So think about the thing you lay your head on for eight hours a night. If it's not exactly right for you, it can lead to needless tossing and turning, or worse, have you waking up with an unrelenting kink in your neck. My new Lagoon pillow has helped me improve my sleep immensely by pairing me with the performance pillow that has everything I need. So I personally was matched with the Otter pillow, shout out to Team Otter, which I love because it has a gentle cooling effect. And I was able to choose how much stuffing I wanted in it, which is super important to me because I'm doing a decent amount of CrossFit these days and my shoulders are kind of creaky. So having a pillow that is stuffed just to the right height keeps my neck and head in exactly the right position and comfortable for the entire night. And as of fall 2023, Lagoon launched their 100% Mulberry Silk pillowcases. It's cool to the touch, buttery soft, and great for your skin and hair. You've got to go check out this pillowcase if you want to feel great and look great every morning. Waking up for morning workouts has never felt better. I'm refreshed and pain-free thanks to my Lagoon pillow. To check it out for yourself, go to lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance and take the two-minute sleep quiz to find your perfect pillow match and then use the code PERFORMANCE for 15% off your first purchase. That's code PERFORMANCE at lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance, whole 15% off, and the link is in the show notes. You can just click through there.